So welcome back, everybody. Now uh, I'm here with uh, Rob Tiffany. Uh, Rob, thank you very much for being here, uh, a seasoned IoT professional. Uh, great to have you here. We're going to talk about IoT business models and how to cope with these challenging times where we are facing a, a economic downturn and, uh, and, uh, and, and a potential crisis. So, um, Rob, can you introduce yourself? Yeah. Uh, and tell, uh, who are you and what, the, what do you do? Yeah, what the heck am I doing? Uh, so yeah, Rob Tiffany. So I'm a VP and head of IoT strategy at Ericsson. Uh, Ericsson is, you know, makes the network cellular equipment that sells to mobile operators so that we can all talk on our phones and stuff like that. Uh, been in the IoT business way too long. Did it, did weird startups in the 90s with vending machines. Um, Spent a lot of time at Microsoft, helped build Azure IoT. It was on that team in early days. Uh, built an industrial IoT platform at Hitachi called Lumata, running in factories and on bullet trains. And so lots of crazy experiences. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm happy that we're going to talk about business today. Most of the time in IoT, you know, there's so much focus on technology all the time. Um, but yeah, something like these business models, which a lot of people don't really think about very much, you know, and, uh, but to your point right now in this, uh, economic environment, they actually could be a lifesaver for a lot of companies for sure. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. So, so you said you worked at Hitachi, you worked at Microsoft, so you have a very diverse background. Uh, and I, and I always when I, when I try to explain to people why IoT is hard is because you have this, um, uh, this product stack that is um, has basically every IT technology you can imagine, right? You have like yeah. front end in a dashboard, then you need data processing, then you need then the network, then you have the RF, then you have the embedded, then you have the hardware. So, and if you want to make sure that it all works perfect, you need to have a lot of knowledge, and the scope is so big, yeah. and your risk exposure is so high. So that's that's uh, that's why it's hard. Um, but it, I mean. Absolutely. When I look at your profile, that that is probably the diverse competences that you have uh, bring you uh, into IT. That's that's really cool. Hey, um, yeah. so um, um, so so when we're uh, talking about IoT business models, a lot of the times, like product as a service. With right. IoT, we can as a service everything. So so you must have been like thinking a lot. I mean, the world has changed so massively in the last yeah. four weeks. So, so what, can you share your thoughts with us? Yeah. You, you know, um, yeah. Let people don't have as much cash in their pocket right now as they used to. <laughs> so we're going <laughs> okay. to have to pivot in uh, some way uh, to, to make it easier for customers to buy our products and services. Um you know, when I got started doing this stuff back in the 90s, it was with the and, and, you know, you talk about having to know so many different kinds of technologies to make all this stuff work. And I think what made it easier for me today or over the last you know, bit of time was how hard doing IoT was in the 90s with the most primitive cellular or otherwise data networks. There was all kinds of technologies uh, I remember having to work with, you know, in a team to build something to monitor vending machines remotely. We had a whole team of RF engineers. We were having to create our own modems, bouncing packets off of like these open business radio towers. Um, just crazy stuff. I never thought we'd be building firmware boxes, putting in machines, building our own modems, building everything. It was really hard. <laughs> IoT was so hard back then, um, and you had to pay by the byte in many cases. Uh, it was horribly expensive to do this, but mm -hmm. I think you learned lessons back then about efficiency, about making things tiny and small. When, when you grow up in a world where sending data over a wireless network was just incredibly expensive, it kind of trains your brain uh, to think about absolute efficiency at, at every step uh, to, to bring those costs down. And so when I think of costs, if I think of my first experience, if I break away from the technology part, I'm doing this startup and we're going to monitor vending machines so that we can see their inventory in real time uh, with the basic thinking early on was you've got guys in the morning, they 
have a their pickup truck and they full of products, candy, drinks, whatever, to go fill vending machines around the city. And they mindlessly are just driving all over their area, their region, uh, to check and see if I need to fill more products in the vending machine, candy bars, Cokes, whatever. And so the simple idea initially uh, was, you know, we had people, you know, again, RF engineers, um, stuff, people, we were this, doing stuff on PCs. Uh, initially, it was something as simple as I want to tell you where you need to go and what to bring, but more importantly, where not to go and what not to bring. You always hear about simple things like I don't want to do a truck roll to go visit someplace because it's expensive to do that. So we started off with that idea. If you know the notion when you're doing a startup, especially if you're doing hardware, um, the first version of your product will always be the most expensive version of that product because you're not worrying about costs. You're just trying to get something to work. And so we're building radio technology or we're, you, you know, actually if I go into a city, I can't count on one type of wireless technology to work back then in the 90s. The, I would break the city, it looked like a pie. This wedge of the pie would use this wireless technology, this one would use a different one. And so we would have to have lots of different communications technologies to give coverage, right? Mm -hmm. And so it was crazy. Um, so the problem is, is that the technology we made initially, it was very expensive. We're gonna install this equipment into a vending machine and the vending machines were dumb back then, no intelligence, fully mechanical. So we would put cabling in. We had our black box with firmware. It's monitoring you putting money into the machine, which buttons you're pushing, spirals, pushing out candy bars or chips or whatever. And so uh, we're monitoring all this stuff mechanically and then putting an antenna on top of the vending machine to, to find out what's going on. And so it was really expensive, and we knew, and, and no one was thinking about as a service or anything like that back then, or subscription models, but we knew that what we had was going to be too expensive to install in each vending machine. That, As it turns out, it's not Coca-Cola or Pepsi or these companies that own vending machines. It's actually these companies that own thousands of them. And so if I told them, hey, I need you to give me – $500 or $1,000 per vending machine for all this gear, you know, they'd say, get out of my office. There's no way. And so what we had to do, we came up with a model. We, after doing pilots and trials, we determined that people could save more than $25 a month, basically, in cases a lot more, uh, through the efficiencies gain from not having to go do all these things. Um, and so we basically what we did is we said, OK, it's going to be a subscription and you're going to pay us twenty five dollars per month per vending machine to do this. And we have to kind of guarantee you that you're going to make more than that amount of money you know, or save more than that so that it's a good deal for you. Um, and so that's kind of how it proceeded. And that's how we kind of got into that space. Um, and, you know, how sometimes you start going down a road with one idea and then something pops in that you didn't expect. Um what we didn't see coming, because we're just not that bright, is the idea of marketing and merchandising. Uh, pretty soon you found out that, you know, a lot of times you might see vending machines, a bunch of them together in a certain building or on different floors of a skyscraper. We started finding out in real time people's preferences. Like you find out that people really like Snickers or Cokes or white. But donuts. then you know, like a, a lawyer firm likes more like the Snickers and then the uh, the, the account is like the, uh, the Twix or something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so we found out their preferences in real time. And so because of that, we could change the product mix. And so we maybe you're right, the guys that like the Snickers, we would double or triple up the number of Snickers. Uh, and at the same time, we could find the products that weren't selling very well, and we'd pull those out of the machines. And so all of a sudden, we were making our customers a lot. They were making money, more money per machine, and they were saving money which all exceeded the monthly cost. I'm not going to say it was easy because in those early days, it was a really kind of strange foreign idea to have a subscription for a service and hardware. Um, but it, but it, it worked and it was, it, and it was the only way it was going to work because early on what we right. had built was just too expensive to sell as CapEx. Right. 
Uh, interesting, but yeah, yeah, and it, it's interesting to see is that uh, that people come from the for the bottom line efficiency and they leave with top line growth, right? So yeah, uh, and but that's the thing you were 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 trying to sell them from the start. This is like uh, this paradox, and it's it's I don't know if it's like uh, motivating or it's like depressing to hear that this the same thing happened in the nineties, uh, but probably this is this is uh, as a pattern which 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 is in the market, but yes. um, yeah, yeah, I mean. I mean, I think that is, is super interesting. And I think uh, what, what you're saying is that that so you have the KPEX versus OPEX model. And and um, w- what we see when we experiment with these propositions that um, that uh, now with a very low interest rate, uh, OPEX model sometimes seems not so clear because the, you can also like borrow the KPEX from. But then yeah. if it's KPEX, then all of a sudden I, also the decision becomes harder and yeah, it could, right. could definitely be that this is a, this is a, a, in a time of crisis. Then um, yeah. yeah, something breaks. But what are your thoughts around that? Like how how is that moving at the well, current time? Like got, taking this away from the nineties. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll I'll give you another story that's more recent. Uh, and it and it, while it's not in the middle of the crisis, it's the same problem. You know, you want to make it easier for a customer to to buy or acquire your product or service, and so. A more recent example um, was when I was at Hitachi and building this Lumata thing. Um, Hitachi makes, you know, it's a giant industrial conglomerate. They make all kinds of machines and they make bullet trains. And if you're in Japan or in Asia, you'll see their bullet trains everywhere. But you never saw them in Europe uh, because there's, you know, Siemens, Alstom, you know, incumbent companies already in Europe that have all that. So a more recent example of of doing an as a service model with hardware was just a couple, three, whatever years ago in the UK, they have all their intercity train services. And it turns out all their trains were really, really old and they were not not doing too good. (laughs) And so they did like a lot of either a company or in this case, it was a government putting out a, like an RFP or something to, uh, to say, Hey, we want you to bid on the idea of replacing all of our trains around the UK. And so all the usual suspects that we know who make trains came and did their bid, you know, and you can imagine it was going to cost hundreds of millions or billions of euros for trains all over, you know. And so then you have Hitachi, which has no footprint at all in Europe. But we had confidence with our Lumata IoT platform and the analytics And the fact that our trains had 40,000 sensors on them, giving us real-time telemetry about the health and the status of the train, that we felt confident that we could do trains as a service. And so what that led to is our bid for this, we said, you don't have to pay anything up front. You're going to have a subscription to our trains, and you're going to pay by the trip, by the the kilometer, the mile, the whatever, uh, as a subscription over a long term. And so, uh, it, 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 and it's a risk, of course, because you're betting that your sensor data and your analytics on your IoT platform is going to be enough to keep you from getting into trouble with huge expenses. Because uh, people are like, okay, I'm going to do it as a service, and what I get for it is I get uptime. These trains are going to be running on time. They're going to do what they're supposed to do. It's going to include maintenance, things like that. And so needless to say, we won that bid because our price was a lot lower than our competitors. It was zero. Um, and so that's how we won it. And so now if you go into, if you go to the UK, more, you'll start seeing these crazy looking Japanese trains. Uh, it was really exciting to, uh, Virgin, you know, Richard Branson, you know, he's, he, 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 there's Virgin trains, which I didn't know that. Anyway, I got, there's a picture of him in front of a Hitachi bullet train uh, breaking the champagne bottle on the nose of it, you know, uh, with virgin trains. And so it was, it was an exciting example to see something that we have all talked about in the IoT space, but we didn't see it happen very often. It was kind of uh, theoretical. And so it made it happen. And so, you know, the key, when you say I want to make a hardware product as a service, the only it's a it's a giant risk um, because and so if you don't have all that sensor data that's telling you the status and the health and the performance of that machine 
and can do something about it, you know, if there's a catastrophic failure, a very expensive failure, you could find yourself in big trouble. Now, all that being said, it's not just that simple because someone had to pay somewhere, right? And so in this case, since Hitachi is a giant company, they could afford to build those trains in advance with their own money and then do the subscription. Not every company has enough money in the bank to be able to, to do that in advance, to deliver that kind of model. So I think it just depends on the expense or how big the machines are that you're talking about when, when trying to go after that model. Um, but yeah, it's cool stuff. And that's a super interesting story. They even like have trains as a service in a leasing model. Yeah. And, um, uh, and, uh, and also how you are gonna sell that. I, I, one was in this, uh, I had this round table with the leasing companies and not car leasing, like leasing manufacturing equipment. And I right. thought it was, was very interesting to add the IoT angle to that round table conversation. Um, but I was also, also amazed by, um, how traditional these markets are, right? Like, like if you, and you go and I think also in trains, like, like you have to have a lot of people that, that even can like, can, 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 can switch to a different paradigm and think, Oh, but we can also lease a train, right? So, yeah. um, and, and maybe, yeah, maybe you need a little crisis for that. So maybe there was a, there was an <laughs> internal crisis or something. Yeah. Like if you don't have the ma money in the bank, then. Right. <laughs> this is yeah. the only option. But then you have to have something that finances uh, this. Yeah. So, so moving forward, like, like look, looking around new business models, um, looking at leasing, uh, looking at how, for instance, now traditional electronics distributors are treating the market. Don't you think they have a huge opportunities like the offnets or the future, futures or the arrows to, to, to pivot there to say, okay, let, let, let's just. Yeah. Go into this. So, so what's your perspective there uh, on, on so. where it should be going? Yeah. No, I, I absolutely think so. Um, you know, I won't say any names, but I've, 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 I spend time, you know, different customers and, and, and all other kinds of industries. And so what I keep finding, not all the time, like I, I remember talking to a small manufacturer that makes, uh, you know, like, well, there's, you know, discrete manufacturing, like building cars or things in a, and then there's process manufacturing which could be a refinery with oil or it could be a, a packing, you know, packing food or whatever, moving along something that looks like an assembly line. And what's surprising to me, and maybe it shouldn't be, is many of these large and small medium manufacturers of these equipment, they don't have any sensors at all on them. And so many of them are still going to market with a CapEx model and the idea that this piece of equipment is just going to run until it fails. And you don't know what's it's, you know, and, and it's always going to be a big surprise when it fails. And then whatever that assembly line or process that the customer has, it's going to be down and it's going to take a while to get it fixed. And it's going to cost them a lot of money uh, and the opportunity cost, you know, it disrupts their supply chain and their customers and distributors. And so having discussions with some of these, you know, other manufacturers about adding sensors to it. And then the next step, having that confidence to say, wow, with this information, like if I'm, if I have a somebody line that's rolling boxes, let's say, and it's weighing them as it's going along a line, uh, and there are things that wear down. Maybe there's ball bearings that it slowly are going to wear down. There's all kinds of pieces. Identifying what are the parts that fail, the components that fail, and then how do you put sensors on that to detect that slower, that slow degradation, uh, where you know you're going to get to a point where you're going to have a failure. And then, and then having that confidence to say, you know what? Okay. I could do this kind of like as a lease, as a service, as a subscription. And again, I would have the confidence to, and again, all this assumes, and this could be any smart connected product. This assumes your customer is going to allow you to get that data to monitor that thing yourself. And I know that's another discussion all the time. Who owns the data? The customer says, I own the data. The OEM of the thing says, I own the data. You know, there's always that. But yet, so you have to work through that. But then if you, you can monitor that, um, you can get ahead of these problems. Um, you know, I think a, another great example uh, is a, that company Relayer, the IoT company. Remember, they got yeah. acquired by Munich Re. I thought yeah. their, their business models and their ideas were amazing. Um, 
when you think of simple, you know, using insurance to help things, uh, go, you know, go along. Like, for instance, you know, I remember talking to some of their folks a few years ago and like a simple IoT use case that we've all heard about is leak detection is, you know, in a house, for instance, you know, is there a leak happening underneath the sink or in the pipes and things like that? And so, oh, we'll do IoT leak detection and we'll connect it via wireless and that kind of thing. But I thought they had innovative business models where they worked with insurance companies. And, you know, insurance companies have these things called actuarial tables and they, it's all about risk, right? And so what was really clever is that they could get to the point where they could, the insurance company would actually pay to put in the leak detection sensors and the IoT stuff because when they looked at their risk and their actuarial tables, they realized a flooding in a house or a fire is a horrible expense for the insurance company to have to pay that claim to the customer. It's incredibly expensive. And so the risk reward thing said it's worth it for the insurance company to pay to put in that, those IoT sensors or like smoke alarms in a house, uh, which made it easier to get that business for the IoT company, for Relayer, right? Um, instead of saying, here's this big expense, I want you to pay for me to put this, and the customer's like, ah, whatever. Now the insurance company's paying for it, which yeah, is pretty clever. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and, and, and again, yeah, there, you're, like, you're talking about this, this bottom line, uh, uh, case you have to make, but the, the, the top line, uh, growth opportunities is, is, is amazing. Um, yeah. Uh, well, well, that's that's even harder to sell. We're, we're, uh, when talking about it, this kind of uh, uh, the, the additional information you could have there as an insurer, but also in the leasing model, uh, getting not only let's say predictive maintenance maintenance operational data, but also are are the production lines active at all? And yeah. maybe have a group of companies that are delivering similar commodities. Say, hey, this this machine is is like. 80% on, but there is somebody else is 20% on. Maybe you want to build a little alliance to yeah. to even even out. So that it, these are just came on the table, but it's like it's like super super disruptive. There. Uh, yeah, uh, having that uptime of a machine or whatever. And you're right, having a group of consortium companies. Um, maybe I have an assembly line that makes some kind of widget, whatever. Yeah. T-shirts, uh, printing T-shirts, yeah. Yeah, and maybe I don't need to use it all the time, but maybe there's other companies. It's kind of like Uber matching, right? Yeah. You know, I, I'm not going to use it right now, but you could come in and use my assembly line to make your widget for the next yeah. 16 hours uh, yeah. and, and being able to share. There's all kinds of disruptive models around that. But, but uh, I think, we, and indeed, like, and definitely in times like these, is that, is that, 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 that I mean, of course, now, like the first part of the crisis, people will be like this, and and it's it's like it's a scary moment. It's scary for everybody. Right. It's it's not not fun. But yeah, I think that's the really positive note around it. Is like if you now go in for bottom line efficiency, the, the top line growth opportunities on the midterm of IoT. That is that's always what fascinates me so much. Yeah, and uh, there's uh, there's this uh, this there's this potential hockey stick, right? We're all lacking after. Yeah. So, yeah. so there's there's actually somebody asking a question. Is uh, is predictive maintenance more? This is uh, uh, Uros from uh, Pezzel Instruments. Um, is predictive maintenance more on the rise now than in the past? As the sensor got smaller, the connectivity got cheaper, or, or was this already in the past ten years? So, uh, what do you see on on predictive maintenance uh, happening? Uh, is this uh, right. is this hot or stable or? Well, you know what, the, the term has been hot for a long time. The reality of predictive maintenance hasn't been as real as people thought it would be. Uh, the, people have been saying that casually. Oh, I'm going to do IoT and get predictive maintenance, and I'm going to fix it before it fails. And everybody says that. Um, it hasn't been as easy to do as people thought. You know, they typically think I'm going to do machine learning, and I'm going to figure out, you know, find that needle in the haystack and, and see when things are going to fail and, and be able to, I had, I had personal experience with that to, to be honest and with machine learning across different kinds of industrial machines. Um, it's, it's trickier than you think it's going to be like, for instance, you may come up with machine learning models for a, a piece of equipment and you might get really good and you train the model and it's, and it's really telling you when it's going to fail and you're excited about that. And so then the next step from there is you want to say, okay, you know the, the idea that there's an asset class 
Uh, mm-hmm. And so, or, like, I, I always like, I always just use the cars as an example because everybody can understand a car. So it's a type of car. Let's just say it's a Mercedes ML350 is the asset class. Uh, and then there's your Mercedes and my Mercedes and everyone else's, let's say. And I want to do predictive maintenance on the failure of the engine or something like that. And um, the problem is, is machine learning. And I'm not saying this is always going to be the case because it's not. But at least in the past, trying to get the same models to work uniformly across a fleet of the cars, even if they're all the same asset class, it, it didn't always work like we thought. Um, they weren't, you know. There were always enough differences across instances of these machines uh, t- to make them a little different. And so we, we still have work to do to be able it, – it's a matter of scale. People figure out how to do machine learning and predictive maintenance on one thing, or they do it in a lab, and they can get really good at it. Uh, but doing it at massive scale at, in production at runtime ha- has, has been more you know difficult. It doesn't mean you can't do it, though, with the clever use of just math and some KPIs. Um, if I think back to, I always joke with people, when I think back to the 90s doing the vending machine thing, if it's a, a, a Coke machine, a Pepsi with cold drinks in it, there's a compressor in there to the air conditioning to make it cold, right? And it's a motor, and that compressor can fail. Well, Amazingly, with the use of just normal code that we had back in the 90s and SQL, we were able to predict when those compressors were going to fail without using any sophisticated machine learning from the 20 from the 21st century. Um, yeah. And so, I don't always think it's as hard as you think. If you, I'm a big fan of trying to make digital twins out of everything, a digital twin of your machines, uh, and all those attributes. And then basic things, basic KPIs, how quickly they're trending in a certain direction. Uh, an example I love to use if we stick with cars, you know your your brakes, your brake pads, your brakes go out after a while on your car. As a human being, if you're driving your car and you start hearing the squeaking of your brakes, that's your early warning that things are starting to go wrong. And if you go fix it then, it's only going to cost this much. But if I don't heed that warning and I keep driving and then I hear that grinding sound as the rotors are grinding on my brakes and then I take it to the shop and it's going to cost this much or I may have to totally replace it. We can do those kinds of things with simple analytics that people can understand. You don't have to always do some kind of deep learning, random forest model, weird thing to figure that stuff out. There's always indicators that say the trend is happening in this way and I can predict the time, you know, you're probably going to have total failure in a month or whatever, or a week. But maybe also like one of the the problems we have as IoT industry is that we're always trying to be so darn uh, smart, right? Yes. And and actually your addressable market could be so much, much more, let's say, viable or bigger if – we would just really simplify stuff. And um, I read this article about Nintendo. They always try to grab existing MCU ecosystems, like 10-year-old, very, very well-supported uh, technology, and then build the gaming platform on top of that instead of, like, trying to, like, what Xbox did, right? Like, they put a put a processor in there and they didn't even know how to fully leverage it when they first sold the first version and Nintendo right. did the other way around they said no no like we're going to have something that we really are can like really confident about the technology and we're going to do something completely different with existing technology and sometimes I feel like maybe in IoT we should think a bit more like that so so, so do we need like this super fine grained resolution of movement sensor or just like if something taps or something ticks like that is already enough right so yeah um, yeah yeah. i'm a big fan of massive simplification i think iot is a lot easier than people make it out to be i think people spend too much time trying to show how smart they are Uh, when they talk to people they talk about exotic technologies and things like that and we're missing the value of the simple things you know just the idea of remotely knowing the state of a machine. Normally, I always tell people you're competing against a guy with a clipboard. Um, 
people should go after the simple things. If, if, if we talk about, like, you know, all, all the uh, predictions by analysts over the years about IoT, hockey stick, and being 50 billion devices, and we haven't come anywhere close – I think we I think our industry does a disservice to people because they say things like you need IoT and AI to get value and they are 100 percent wrong. There is tremendous value to be had from just doing the simple things, simple green, yellow, red KPIs. If, if this, then that. Yeah, yes. Uh, I, 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 uh, we have to close off this session, but I think I think that's a great conclusion. So let's keep uh, things simple, yes. uh, and 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 let's not try to have some kind of rat race where we're trying to outsmart each other. But just let's 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 have some very thing basic that really can scale, really can work. Rob, I, I want to thank you very much for all your insights and and being on the, on this conference. And um, and um, I hope you got a good time and um, and uh, um, thanks thanks a lot. Thanks so much for having me. This has been great chatting with you. Perfect. Hey, thanks.